What's up everybody? Thanks to Brandon Sanderson, I've got a different type of video for you today. As anyone who's ever seen the channel knows, I'm a fan of Brandon Sanderson and the Cosmere. And not only do I really enjoy his stories, I also really enjoy listening to his writing advice. I like listening to him talk about the story creation process. And he posted a video recently that I was extremely interested in, which was his top 10 favorite video games of all time. Now I don't talk about it a lot on the channel, but I have mentioned it before. I have loved video games my entire life, so I found this subject immensely interesting. What does one of my favorite authors in the modern day who really likes video games think about video games? What games are important to him and what do they mean to him? And also, because I am me, how can I psychoanalyze him and his storytelling and what I know about him through the games that he says are his favorite? Because I, I really like games, guys. I, I love video games. And so when I listen to people tell their favorite video games and explain why, it, my brain starts getting moved. It's like when you, you know, people have books and you say, oh, that's their favorite book. I think I know a lot about them. Or, oh, that person's favorite song is that one? Yeah, I know who they are. That's kind of how people can be with video games. And sometimes it's it's fun and sometimes it's it's funny. And sometimes you could be a jerk about it. Let's try to be the first one. But we'll, I, I'm just going to talk about his list of games, my thoughts on those, and the way that I think they might relate to the ways that he loves to tell stories or or whatnot. This is a little bit of an experimental video. I don't usually do anything like this, but because it's Brandon Sanderson, I'm going to use this opportunity to jump out of just the normal book sphere and let's talk about Brandon Sanderson's favorite video games. Number 10 on his list was Katamari Damacy and one of the jokes that he made about that video game was that it was probably the closest he's ever going to experience to like being on drugs. If you don't know what that game is it's actually a video game where you are the story is is kind of buck wild but it's the gameplay of the video game is that you are a small object and you roll over objects to get bigger so like you start as i don't know a cat toy and you roll over a peanut butter sandwich and that sticks to you and then you're bigger so you keep rolling and you roll over more stuff until you get bigger and eventually you're rolling over like large sections of the planet it has a lot of charm it has a lot of heart it also has like a crazy insane japanese storytelling style which a lot of times when i hear people talk about Brandon Sanderson and they read some of his works they think how he must be extremely anime inspired but as far as I can tell listening to him he has watched some classic anime he hasn't actually watched as much anime as you may think but as you can tell from this list it seems like he may be a fan of Japanese RPGs as well as Japanese storytelling methods in the video game sphere which I think you're going to see a lot of crossover between manga anime and, and JRPGs or Japanese video games in general I think that's what we get with Katamari Damacy Katamari Damacy. I'm not sure how you say that. I think that's what we're seeing here. Number nine, Undertale, the indie game that like swept the internet by storm. Like if you know anything about memes, you've probably heard Megalovania or you've at least seen memes from this video game. It's an interesting video game because it sort of has a Japanese RPG style art and it plays a lot on Japanese RPG style, like classic Japanese RPG style tropes. But one of the most interesting points which Brandon touches on in his video is that Undertale is kind of like a look and a great critique of like video games as a medium in a really interesting way. So in addition to it just being a really good game, it kind of steps up the next level. It, it utilizes its form, which I'll talk about a little bit later. And it also is more than just a regular game. It's actually like a higher level of art if you want to get pretentious about it. I think it can be enjoyed whether you are enjoying it just for, you know, the surface level production or something deeper. I greatly enjoyed Undertale when I played it and it sounds like Brandon did as well. That's a very solid pick showing that he's probably someone that does know a lot about games, gaming industry, the way that game stories are told. He's worked on video games before in like a writing sense. I think Undertale on his list really may show like the the love that he has for video games on like a deep level. Number eight is Fallout New Vegas. This is a favorite among many Fallout players. While many people may pick Fallout 3 as their favorite, Fallout New Vegas really was next level in terms of writing and storytelling, which of course are probably things that you could guess Brandon Sanderson holds dear to his heart. Fallout New Vegas also like has a lot of branching path stuff and is done in a way that like some of the other Fallout games just don't live up to. Fallout New Vegas was kind of the full realization of the 3D Fallout game that Fallout 3 
sort of hoped to be. It's an open world sci-fi post-apocalyptic game. It seems like a solid choice for many a gamer and it sounds like that holds true with Brandon Sanderson as well. I haven't played Fallout New Vegas for more than a couple hours so I have less to say about this one. Number seven on Brandon Sanderson's list was Super Mario World and while Brandon specified when he was making his list that this was a favorites list not a greatest list, Super Mario World could also cross over into many people's greatest games of all time list. Not just because it is one of like the most important games fundamentally and like inspirational games for other things in this medium, but also because it's just a dang good game that really holds up. You might not be able to tell, but Super Mario World is one of my favorite video games of all time. And while I think that we have had a modern platform resurgence to where like there are other things that can compete with this game, there's still so many things that it does well. And I think that Super Mario World represents a time in platform history where level design was king. Today, algorithmically designed games and like mass generated huge things are, are the keys to success in the modern era, but Super Mario World represents a game that is masterfully crafted in a way that like the levels themselves are art. Level design back then was amazing and these artists that worked on this game were some of the best. I think that's why when Brandon talks about not being into platformers but still loving this game, it wasn't just nostalgia factor. This game holds a bit more of a punch in the platformer genre than, than you may think if you don't like platformers if you haven't played Super Mario World, it's a very important game and a very good game at the same time. Totally agree with you on that one, Brandon. Number six on Brandon Sanderson's list was The Curse of Monkey Island, which I believe is the third Monkey Island game. I have not played The Curse of Monkey Island, but I have played Monkey Island 1 and 2. And the Monkey Island games sort of serve as a classic adventure style game where there was a lot of storytelling and puzzle solving, but this was one of the earlier genres where you got a lot of that storytelling when consoles were focused more on platforming and action. Though by the time The Curse of Monkey Island came out, that was starting to expand more as more JRPGs were available on consoles. The benefit of adventure games like The Curse of Monkey Island, which I can attest to with at least the first two games because I played both of these games with my wife, as Brandon said that he, his wife played Curse of Monkey Island with him, is you can experience these games, which are technically single player games, with another person and it's still just a rich, rewarding experience. There's a lot of world building in these games because you're walking back and forth between between the zones, you get to appreciate the art in ways that you don't always in other games. Because there's puzzles to solve, you actually have to dig deep into the mechanics, the items, the descriptions, what the characters are saying, the story, and solve these puzzles. You can do it together. You have to communicate with the people that you're playing with a lot as you're digging through all of these things into an expansive, like, full world experience. Adventure games are something that I still hold value on in my heart, even if the genre itself is not the most popular thing these days. The Curse of Monkey Island takes place back in the days where like adventure games were amazing, they were king, they were very important. I hold those very dear to my heart. I'm glad that Brandon does as well. And also as someone who values storytelling and world building and mystery, you can see that kind of influence on his worlds as, like a lot, I think. Number five is The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, which I also happen to be replaying with my children right now. So in a similar way that Brandon Sanderson is sort of a modern fantasy writer and he's taking a lot of inspiration from classic fantasy and bringing it into the modern age with more focus on characters and such, the Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild is a reimagining of the classic Zelda formula into a open world game design, which is what people like these days, I guess. Zelda, like fantasy, still holds a lot of these classic elements and uses them to great effect, but still brings things in a refreshing new package that works for everybody. Because of the nature of this being an open world game and the way that they tell their story in Breath of the Wild, it's another example of a video game that has a lot of depth to it that you have to figure out for yourself. One of my favorite parts about the Cosmere as I'm digging through Stormlight Archive and the Mistborn series is that there's so much mystery and so much meat to unpack and you get more out of it the more you put into it. You can read the books and enjoy them at surface level in the same way that you can play Zelda and just beat the dungeons, but there's so much more if you're willing to put in the time and effort yourself. Number four on the list is Halo 2, which this just happens to be one of my favorite Halo games as well. As someone that doesn't care about competitive multiplayer, the same way that Brandon talks about not 
really caring about competitive multiplayer games. I also very much enjoyed Halo 2. I was all about the co-op, though, as he cared more about the single player. The thing about Halo 2, in his eyes, was that the writing really felt like it fit the game, and the story of Halo 2 fit the gameplay in a way that it sort of matched with the soundtrack and everything working together to be a cohesive piece of art in the way that kind of only games can be. Movies don't have the gameplay element, and while I think the storytelling can be a lot deeper in a lot of ways in a book than those other mediums, you don't get the music, you don't get the visual complex. Brandon talks about Halo 2 being like the complete package and bringing that all together. I agree. Personally, over my history, I've talked about how I think that the Halo stories are not for me. I think that they're kind of bad, if I'm being honest. But in all actuality, because I think Halo was such a fun game, I have played every entry in the series a significant number of hours. So I think Halo 2 is a solid pick for that list as well. This is kind of the first game on the list where we get to see a lot more of that sci-fi interest of Brandon, really, though Fallout New Vegas a little bit. I feel like this is the first like hard sci-fi thing that we're seeing on this list. Number three is Final Fantasy X. So I talked before about some of that like Japanese JRPG style influencing Brandon Sanderson's ideas in the Cosmere. Final Fantasy X, Brandon has said that all of the games on this list, he enjoys many in the series. So Final Fantasy is one of those series that's like a classic JRPG staple, which I guess if you don't know what that means, it's Japanese role-playing game. And Final Fantasy X is a very widely loved entry in that series. One of the things that Brandon said was interesting about this game was that instead of being about your traditional fantasy protagonist, it was about a jock. And I think that's telling because what we see in Brandon Sanderson's Cosmere is that over the course of Mistborn and Stormlight Archive and Warbreaker and Elantris, we see a varied cast of characters from different backgrounds, different casts in society. And yet what Brandon's writing does is it allows us to empathize and like relate to all of them on some level. And this sort of empathy is something that readers talk about being important in stories, being able to understand different characters from different backgrounds. Brandon, I think, really does that well in so many of his books, so it makes complete sense to me that he would like something like this game, which has different protagonists than you would normally see, and yet you still fall in love with them and find out what makes them tick in ways that are super enjoyable in the storytelling experience. Number two on the list is Bloodborne. He says that Bloodborne is part of the Souls franchise series. It really is a spiritual successor, even if it technically isn't a Dark Souls game. Well, I personally probably would pick Dark Souls as my favorite of the list. Bloodborne is a solid pick. The most interesting parts about Bloodborne from a gameplay standpoint is what Brandon talks about, which is the game is a harsh master. It wants you to learn what it wants you to learn, and it will teach you how to play it, and it is the harshest master possible. These games are known for being difficult. They're also known for being like incredibly rich and dense, but also thick. They're hard to get into and their storytelling methods are complex. Like I said, with some of the other games on this list, the story is what you put into it because it doesn't have normal traditional cutscenes like most games where the story is handed to you. This is a video game and playing the video game is part of the story and unlocking, like digging out the mystery for yourself as you uncover clues from the items that you find, the bosses that you defeat, the layout of the levels, like this is all a mystery that the player can choose to engage with or not engage with, but the actual like gameplay mechanics themselves feed into the story in a way that only games can. It works really well for this medium. In all of the Souls games, to some degree, magic is either coming or going into the world in ways similar to the Stormlight Archive or Mistborn. These games have very hard magic systems at their fundamental layer, and everything is about push and pull and balance similar to a Cosmere world. Bloodborne is an awesome mixture of cosmic horror and gothic horror, and frankly, I get strong Mistborn vibes from Bloodborne. In fact, if you look at the thumbnails that I've made for my Mistborn videos, I use Bloodborne art in those thumbnails because I feel like there is a strong connection to some of the themes and vibes I'm getting from both of these things. Not only do I understand why Brandon might pick this, I also have the Soul series high on my list as well. Number one on Brandon Sanderson's list by sheer number of hours played is Civilization 6. I feel like it's harder to dissect this one because Brandon might just like it for a strategy and video game aspect, but because it's Civilization 6, seeing the ways the different societies and politics and battles and wars and technology move and work together with other societies, these are things that you could see being inspirations or like play 
opportunities for him to world build in a game sense. While I respect the Civilization series, I have very little experience with it myself because I find 4X strategy games like these super detailed strategy games very intense and they go over my head very quickly because they take hours and hours to learn. But I can see why Brandon Sanderson, the dude that enjoys making worlds and planets and universes for a living, might love exploring all of these intricacies in his free time. And that completes Brandon Sanderson's top 10. I think it's a solid top 10. I think we can see a lot of his inspirations and loves cross over with the way that he writes stories in that list. I wanted to go ahead and talk about his runners up. But if you've liked this video so far, I want to remind you that you could leave a thumbs up on it down below. But let's go ahead and talk about what he listed as his runners up. These are games that didn't make his list but could have been switched for one reason or another. Maybe he hasn't played other games in the series, etc. I'll go ahead and talk about these games. The first on the list is Elder Scrolls 3 Morrowind. This is the prequel to Skyrim. I feel like everybody who cares about video games knows what Skyrim is or has probably played Skyrim because it's available on nearly every platform known to man. <laughs> But it is an open world fantasy role playing game similar to the type of thing that Brandon Sanderson might make himself. While Skyrim is very solidly like Viking inspired and like obviously there's other things in there too but it's very much Viking level magic system and world building. Morrowind is a lot more alien and magical and frankly feels a lot more like a Brandon Sanderson world I think. Next up on his list was Mass Effect. He's only played Mass Effect 1. I'm a huge fan of the Mass Effect series but the level of world building and space opera ness and character development like those games are solid i really think brandon sanderson would like those games if he played them he said he was waiting on hd uh, upgrade which i think we will probably get i think we've had announced recently that's a super solid pick his next on the list was bioshock infinite a game that i think is absolutely incredible in so many ways it's one of my favorite stories in a video game so much mystery so many awesome plot twists so many it's just, it's wild. I don't want to give it away. Bioshock Infinite is an amazing game. It didn't make Brandon's list because he hasn't played the other Bioshock games or didn't like them at least. Bioshock 1 and 2 I don't think are as good, so I sort of agree with him there. But Bioshock is all about world building. Much like Sanderson's works, the world is one of the characters in the Bioshock games. Like it's a huge, huge element in the way the story is told and interacting with the world and uncovering it and seeing it visually and seeing the oppressiveness of it and the weird intricacies of the the forces at play in a Bioshock world and the way that like power is corrupting different people differently like that's a huge part of it so interacting in a Bioshock world is very similar to like massive world building in a good book the next game Brandon listed was Doom which is a game where you are a space marine who fights demons and tries to send them back to hell at one point you go to hell to fight demons and try to seal up the portal I think it's very easy to dismiss this game and this series to just like pure shooting and action I think there's actually a lot more important things here, not just historically, because Doom is a very important game historically in like the canon of video games, but also I think there is more to what makes Doom good than, than just that. But honestly, I think it fits on this list mostly just because it's a really fun game to shoot demons. Castlevania Symphony of the Night is another one of these Japanese action games instead of a role play. I mean, it technically is a role playing game, but it's not what you think of when you think of a Japanese role-playing game. It's mostly an action game, but this game is all about exploring the world and playing with different combat and different weapons. It's all about like, it's another one of ga those games that's really good about creating an atmosphere and using the gameplay as part of the world building experience. Brandon said he's only played the game once, so he can't include that. Another game that he's only played and he hasn't played the other ones of is The Witcher, which I feel like everyone knows what The Witcher is because of the TV show. So I don't have to dive into that much. Technically, I think The Witcher is grimdark. I think it's why maybe the series as a whole didn't relate to Brandon as much, but this game has gotten a bazillion accolades. Everyone loves this. Everyone's excited for cyberpunk. So many people love the TV show. I don't need to talk about The Witcher. Another game that Brandon listed is Shadow of the Colossus. And I think that this game for, for people that aren't just like into games that are a little bit older. This was originally a PlayStation 2 game. It's got an HD re-release, but it wasn't a massive seller. Shadow of the Colossus is like one of the most interesting artistic sort of games, I think, that you can find, especially from that era. Shadow of the Colossus feels like a game that could inspire many a book with the way, the way that it is so subtle in its storytelling and 
this is another perfect example of something that uses the video game medium to be part of its storytelling. It's a game that uses like a little bit of deception. The player thinks that they're doing one thing, but over the course of the game, through subtle clues and hints and the way that the world reacts to what you're doing, you realize that maybe you're a little bit confused about what's going on. No spoilers for Sanderson series, but I feel like this very much fits with the vibe of some of his stories, maybe multiple of his stories. He said he'd only play the game once, so it didn't go on his list, but Shadow of the Colossus is very, I think, very, very, very good for the Sanderson Cosmere vibe. Shadow of the Colossus is a great video game to go pair with that. Sanderson also mentioned X-Wing, which is like a space simulation fighter. It doesn't hold up as much these days, though I think that we're starting to see other games start to take up this place. Heck, Squadrons just got released. I don't know anything about that game. Is it good? Have you played Squadrons? Another game Brandon lists is Braid. Braid is like the stereotypical modern example of like the new era of indie independent video games and how they can be art. Brandon mentions that in his video and the way that it tells its story, it is like very bizarre, but it's also like a puzzle platformer. Braid is a weird sell, but it's also a beautiful piece of work. And I love that he mentions it in this list. The last game that he mentions in his runners up is like, I think it's called East Yeast. Book one and two, I haven't played these, but these are JRPGs. I think that you could probably apply the rest of the things that I've said about JRPGs to the rest of this list to that. And that completes the Brandon Sanderson assessment that I have of his video game preferences. Was this an interesting video for you? Am I crazy? Do you agree? Do you disagree? I'd like to hear your thoughts on this type of video because obviously it's very different compared to the things that I normally make. It was very fun and it was also very easy for me to do because I'm also very passionate about video games. So if you do like this video, thank you so much. I would ask that you would leave a thumbs up or a comment down below with what's your top 10 favorite video games? What do you think about the video games on Brandon's list? Do you have any beefs with the games that he picked? If you would like to see more videos from me, please remember to subscribe and if you hit the bell, you'll get notifications whenever I post new videos. If you'd like to talk about this video or anything book related, tangentially related to the things that we talked about, there's a link to a discord down below which you can join and Join my gaggle of book friends as we talk about whatever just happens to come up any day of the week. If you'd like to support this channel financially, there's a store down below where you can get shirts like this one and others. And there's also a Patreon link where you can join my Patreon if you'd like to help in that way. I love you guys so much. I hope you're having a great day. And if you like video games, I hope that you are playing something awesome right now. Please comment down below what video game you're playing right now. Now, why don't you all go out there and be excellent to each other. I will see you next time. Bye. Always looking out tired sleep. No one ever get enough. If it don't show up, I might get fired sleep. No one ever get enough. Always looking out tired sleep. No one ever get enough. If it don't show up, I might get fired.